Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. Today we've got a great story of exposing an awful manager. Our first story of the day is from Maceman486. I exposed my manager as a hypocrite. I work in a residential facility for people on probation. They can serve out a sentence there on work release or if they're sentenced to our drug treatment program. So they come and go a lot. Part of my job is sending anything new they bring back to the property office to be inventoried or held as contraband. Stuff that isn't illegal, but they can't have it in the facility like chewing tobacco. They're not allowed to bring outside food or drinks, so part of my job is throwing it away if it's perishable or unwrapped. This guy returned with a bag of burgers and burritos his job was throwing away. So I disposed of it, and he complained to the policy compliance manager who runs the property office. She told me that I had to get with that client for financial reimbursement. I tried getting her to understand that I threw that stuff away because it would not keep in the back office, as her own policy states, and she didn't care. Her words to me were, property officers are the ones who sort through the property for contraband or disposable items. Your job is not to review the property, just bag it up and label it with their name. Everything goes through property. She even underlined the word everything in her email. It felt like she was making up her own rules despite what policy said because she didn't want to deal with a complaining work release inmate. The malicious compliance. Yesterday, a client returned with a half-eaten bag lunch we provided people leaving for work with in case they can't feed themselves. I saw my opportunity. I did exactly what you think and sent a brown bag of half-eaten sandwich and cornbread to be inventoried as property. I saw her email today going off on me for being passive aggressive or that I need to be retrained. She normally doesn't CC anyone else in her emails about issues but she did today. My direct supervisor, the operations commander and the deputy director were all included so they could see her witch me out over the half eaten food I sent her staff. She must have felt like Obi-Wan having the high ground. Too bad she did in fact underestimate my power. I included even more supervisory staff in my response and directly quoted her original emails to me and pointed out that she told me her staff were the ones that throw things away and that I was to bag and tag everything. I was later told by my laughing supervisor that the director himself laughed as he told her, you told them to send you everything. You can't get upset because he did what you said. I think the policy compliance manager made this reply email so much easier. Honestly, it would have been easy enough for OP to maybe get reamed out and just deal with it. But by them CCing everybody in and bringing everybody in themselves, it's so easy for OP to be like, great, you brought the audience, you did the hard work. Do you think OP should be watching their back working around this person from now on? Or do you think it's the manager that's got to be more careful about how they do their job? Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. Our next story is from Inadaptido. Don't want to see that button? You got it. My job requires wearing a suit, shirt, and tie, which are provided by the company, and looking sharp at all times. Freshly shaved, polished shoes, iron clothes, the works. I've always complied with everything except for one small detail, the shirt neck button. My Adam's apple is a bit larger than normal, and fastening that button is very uncomfortable for me, especially with the somewhat tight shirts they give us. I tried altering the neck and using extenders, but no matter what I did, it was still pretty unbearable. In the end, I decided to leave it unfastened and just push the tie knot up enough to cover that area. Not very elegant, but since I barely crossed paths with my manager, who is very fastidious about this, and our customers really don't pay that much attention to us, I could get away with it for a long time. Then the inevitable happened. Some weeks ago, I had a somewhat frantic afternoon in which my tie loosened, and before I could fix it, my manager came in unexpectedly to grab some papers. It took him a second to see my neck was unbuttoned, so he called me to his office for an explanation. I tried to justify myself, but he couldn't care less about my Adam's apple and told me in no uncertain terms that he did not want to see that neck button ever again or I would be written up. I despaired the whole following day trying to find a solution when it suddenly hit me. If the problem was seeing the button, why not remove it entirely? So I took them out from every work shirt I have, and boy, I don't know why I didn't think of this before. It never occurred to me that without it, it's a lot easier to cover that area with the tie knot, which I don't have to push up so much, so it's more comfortable, 
and therefore it's harder to see whether it's fastened or not. It's been almost a month since, and not only has my manager not noticed, he was actually inches from my face recently to adjust my collar, which was a bit uneven, he's fastidious like that, and he was still none the wiser. I have to clarify the shirts are technically company property, even though we keep them at home, and they would not be happy to find out what I did, but, well, my manager did say he didn't want to see that button again. Does anybody else think it's a bit weird that the manager came over and just, like, decided to adjust OP's collar? Also, considering that this is, like, company-supplied shirts, you would wish that these shirts are actually fitted to the people that they supply them to. The problem clearly is OP doesn't have a properly fitted shirt, and while it may not be an issue for literally everybody else, the company's ridiculous for expecting OP to wear something that doesn't properly fit. Our next story is F. Larry. I'm a part-time delivery driver. This afternoon, my dispatcher told me to pick up a portable swamp cooler at one of our stores and deliver it to a customer. She said that if the dude there is giving me any lip, have him call her. No problem, I'm out the door. That store is inside a big facility and is run by one person. A guy I don't know, or so I thought. I get there and I recognize F. Larry. He was a service manager at a shop I delivered at my old store. He was a pain. Always right, always arrogant. When the business changed hands, he was let go. And he doesn't recognize me. It's been a year and the context is different. This'll be fun, scrolled through my head. First, he tells me that the morning driver was to pick it up, intimating that I'm the wrong driver. This was just him peeing on my leg. While flipping him off in my mind, I explain that morning leaves at 1 p.m. and I'm the afternoon driver. Then F. Larry shows me a skanky, short chunk of garden hose and says it has to come back with the cooler. Oh, no problem, I'll let everyone know, I say kindly while flipping him off in my mind. And, he says, this has to be returned first thing Monday morning. I reply with a kind, oh, of course. As I flip him off for the third time, he curtly gives me additional instructions and warnings about its care and operation, and I'm outwardly polite the whole time. F. Larry then leads the way as I wheel it out of the labyrinth from his lair to the parking lot. When we get to the first of many doors, I move to the front of the unit to lift the wheels over the door sill so I don't tip it over. F. Larry comments that I must have forgotten the safety video about how we are not to pull loads through doors, but push them. This was just him peeing on my leg again. There is no such video. Cue my malicious compliance. For all the remaining doors, I forest scumped my way through taking inordinate amounts of time to work the front wheels over the door sill from the back. I could tell that F. Larry was fuming at how long this inept delivery driver was taking. It was delicious. Fast forward about an hour, and I'm back in my store and gleefully telling my dispatcher about making F. Larry mad. She loved it and she suggested I go talk to the store manager. Turns out this idiot had been back and forth with F. Larry since last week. My dispatcher had sent the morning driver over there to pick it up, and F. Larry wouldn't let him take it. F. Larry elevated this to the district manager, and it had taken until today to get it done. Anyway, my store manager has had enough. Come Monday morning, there'll be reasons the morning driver can't go get the cooler and bring it back. It's going to be me in the afternoon, with a smile and internal flips. I love my job, F. Larry. I feel like we all have our own versions of Larry's that we've dealt with throughout our lives. The person that you gotta work with them for some reason. And for some reason, even though like, maybe they're just trying to be helpful or whatever, but they like walk you through these steps and they're like telling you, don't forget this, don't forget that. And in your mind, the only thing going through it is like, oh, I hate this person. I hate their guts. Oh, I want to flip them off. Our next story is from Fresno Mac. Insurance firm insists on direct billing, even though cousin preferred reimbursement. Okay then, have it your way. I may get some insurance related terms confused because I'm not knowledgeable about private insurance systems outside my country, India. My cousin is Indian and lives in India and works for a major American cruise line. His usual schedule is 9 months of work sailing around North America and 3 months of vacation time back in India. The maritime insurance company that he's insured with provides medical coverage for him. When he was on vacation in India, he tore his ACL and MCL and injured his meniscus playing football. Soccer. It required a ligament reconstruction surgery and some months of rehab before he was fit to work again. 
There is public health care in India, but for something like knee ligament reconstruction, it still costs money, although not as much as private hospitals, and also takes time, as there is a waiting list. So he decided to go private, which is costlier. He contacted the insurance company to confirm his eligibility to receive coverage, and they confirmed that he was indeed eligible. So he went to an arthroscopic surgeon and got a letter from him detailing the estimated cost of the surgery, the date, and other relevant medical details. He emailed the details to the insurance company and they approved the surgery. Only one problem, they insisted on direct billing to the doctor. Now, doctors in India are familiar with direct billing, but it's mostly with insurance companies that operate domestically in India. Naturally, the doctor was hesitant to accept the arrangement despite receiving a letter of guarantee from them. He simply wasn't convinced of the legal validity of a letter of guarantee from a foreign insurance company in India. What if they, for some reason, refused to pay? He can't do anything about it. So at this point, my cousin stepped in and suggested to the company that he'll foot the bill up front and then submit a claim after which the company can reimburse him. The insurance company seemed to agree at first, but this medical cost containment company they were partnered up with was vehemently opposed to the idea. They insisted on direct billing, even though it doesn't make a lick of difference in terms of cost. He tried convincing them that no doctor in India would accept this arrangement from a foreign insurance company, but they wouldn't relent. At last, he said screw this and went on a city-wide search and finally found a top doctor in one of the most expensive hospitals in the city who was willing to operate on his knee with a letter of guarantee. The doctor also worked in three months of post-op physiotherapy costs into the surgery bill. The hospital had the best rooms, the best service, and the highest quality of care. The doctor worked with some of the top athletes in the country, and the final estimated cost was at least 700% more than the previous doctor. The insurance company didn't object, and simply approved the surgery. He expected them to question the cost, but it was only around $8,000, which is the equivalent of like four ambulance rides in America. That must be a paltry sum for the company. At the end of the day, my cousin got the best care possible because of the insurance company's inexplicable insistence. Or maybe they had good reason, but they lost money at the end of the day. Everybody's amazed at the 8000 bill. Let me tell you, it's a small amount for Americans, but it's still a big bill in India. A lot of Americans are flocking to India for surgeries for this particular reason. You receive great quality healthcare at some of the best hospitals here and the end cost is almost a fraction of what you would end up paying in the US. And that's including for the flight tickets and hotel tickets at hotels like Hilton and Marriott. Sadly, I've had a little bit of experience with companies like this, maybe not specifically insurance, but when it comes to reimbursing you directly, that's like absolute last resort. They don't want to give you that money upfront because you might be scamming them. If they pay the doctor, at least they know for sure that the doctor did that surgery. But if they reimburse you directly, all they have to really go on is a bill from the doctor that you're presenting to them. They just in general don't like that, which kind of sucks. And our final story of the day is from Gladbutt. Yesterday at the Rippy Mart gas station, I pull into the spot next to a police on a motorcycle, right in front of the dumpster because it's covered by a big oak tree. I jump out and throw a bag of fast food scraps and drink into the dumpster. Manager yells across the lot not to use their dumpster as she wheels a huge tub of garbage bags from the dispensers to throw in her dumpster. Yes ma'am, I'm sorry. So I jump in the truck and drive to the cans by the dispensers and fill them with every bit of trash I had in the bed including a good amount of broken bricks. As I leave, I wave to her as she was talking to the cop. He smiled. I mean, I don't mean to boil it down to the lowest common denominator, but like, at least OP was putting all of their trash, especially stuff that's just like, lying around in their vehicle, in an actual trash can, right? At least it would actually get collected. Something that frustrates me the most is driving down the road and you see like, an empty KFC bucket just sitting in the middle of the street. Or the common offenders like a metal can, a grocery bag. People are so crap with their trash. 
But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another compliance story that was way crazier than any of the ones in this video, click on that left video. Or if you missed my latest video, check out the one on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.